IBM could have just saved that money and many, many years later bought two Instagrams. Welcome to Tech Tales. I'm Corbin Davenport. And I'm Cody Toombs. And today we're back for round three of our series on OS2, which was the operating system that Microsoft and IBM worked on together that was going to replace Windows, and then it didn't, and then Microsoft left, and then IBM kept working on it. So this episode, we're actually taking a detour. We're talking about a project that IBM worked on alongside OS2 that was related to it, but it not entirely directly. And it's just, it's kind of wild. And I was reading it and I was like, none of this makes sense. I love it. This has to be its own episode. <laughs> <laughs> so to set the scene for this, I have to go over a couple of things that were happening to IBM and the general computer industry at the time. In October of 1991, Apple, IBM, and Motorola teamed up, and they founded what was called the AIM Alliance, because it's Apple, IBM, and Motorola. Mm -hmm. And their goal was to work together against the growing duopoly of Microsoft and Intel. So... Apple and IBM and Motorola wanted to work together to create competing hardware and software. The main product to come out of the AIM Alliance was the PowerPC platform. PowerPC was a series of RISC processors that was intended to surpass what Intel was producing at the time. Uh, it never really did that. <laughs> At this point, IBM had a lot of separate software projects going on. They had OS2 and PC-DOS, which was their version of Microsoft DOS for PCs. They had another operating system called AIX for their RS6000 workstations. And they also had another software platform called OS400 for their AS400 servers. They all sort of did different things, but IBM looked at all of them and was like, can we maybe try to bridge all these things together so we, we don't have to duplicate our work like three times? That would be cool. So IBM starts working on a new project in 1991 called Workplace OS, which is not a great name. And it's based on primarily two existing software projects. It's based on the Mach 3.0 microkernel developed by Carnegie Mellon University. And it's based on the Taligent operating system that Apple was working on and then spun off into its own company and then didn't really release anything except like that one software library that no one wanted. So I'm going to send you a snippet of an article by David Kirkpatrick for Fortune magazine. And this article kind of explains like what IBM's goals are for this. To not go under. Exa oh, well, up up objective failed. <laughs> yes. IBM has a complex but promising strategy to make power PC computers attractive to all those users of Intel-based PCs. Up till now, they had little choice if they wanted to run application programs on Microsoft's Windows or MS-DOS operating systems which were written specifically to operate on Intel chips. On the same day early next year that IBM introduces its first PCs built around PowerPC chips, it also plans to start selling a new operating system, tentatively named Workplace OS. Calling the product an operating system is misleading, though, since Workplace will let users run applications written for several such systems, including Windows, MS-DOS, and IBM's OS2. Later, IBM will give Workplace the ability to run applications written for Unix and the operating system being developed by Taligent, an IBM-Apple joint venture. At Workplace OS's core is a compact bit of computer code known as a microkernel, which works as a sort of universal connector that can link a variety of hardware architectures to a variety of operating systems. Programmers can readily plug into it all those other operating systems. 
At the same time, with little modification, the microkernel can be adapted to run on different microprocessors. So at the core of Workplace OS, and the article you read touched on this a little bit, is this microkernel. And this is what sits at the very bottom of the system. And this is how most operating systems work. There's a kernel at the very core that talks directly to the hardware. It usually manages like the file system and power management, like really low level stuff that most people don't think about when they're using a computer. So above the kernel would be what IBM called personalities. And these were the operating systems that were all running at the same time, but they weren't like really operating systems, it's it's very complicated. Each personality would provide its own application programming interfaces or APIs. So if someone was familiar with writing Windows software using the Windows APIs, then they could also write software for the Windows personality on Workplace OS, and it wouldn't be too different. Some of the personalities would also provide an application binary interface or ABI, which would let them run compiled software for the operating system without any modification. So the idea was is that you could take your Windows copy of Microsoft Word and run it on the Windows personality on Workplace OS, and it would work fine. Like it would, it would run just as it did on Windows. Can I just say, personalities as a, as a branding choice, exactly as bad as LG Friends. It's IBM, man. They're just not good at this stuff. Neither was LG. (laughs) We're going to be honest here, but go on. Workplace OS would have one personality that IBM called the dominant personality. And this is what was in control of the whole interface. So if the Windows personality was dominant, then you would turn on your computer and boot up Workplace OS and it would look like Windows and it would act like Windows, but you could also run Windows apps and all the other apps from all the other personalities. And the other systems in this case would be called the alternate personalities. So they they weren't really controlling the computer, so to speak, but they were there and they were running in the background. Okay, this this is actually getting, just in terms of terminology, this is almost as cringy as when someone decided, you know what we should have as devices? slave and master devices yeah (laughs) oh i know let's have personalities one of them will be dominant the other ones they'll be kept under the surface waiting to take over (laughs) like come on guys what are you thinking the the fun game you can play with this episode is take a random section and try to figure out if we're talking about workplace os or if we're talking about psychology (laughs) Exactly. I was going to make a Silence of the Lambs joke. Like, seriously, at what point do do we need to actually like call in a profiler? So that's all really complicated. Not just me trying to explain it, but also like on a technical level, this is a lot. And researching this episode, I got to one point, and I'm and I'm about to explain it. That I was like, what? How? How? <laughs> how is this going to happen? And that bit was, is that IBM intended for you, the person using Workplace OS, to be able to choose which personality was dominant and which one would be the alternate one based on what you were already familiar with. So if you were coming from using Windows, you could choose Windows as the personality and then your computer would mostly act like Windows, but with the ability to run all this other software. Or if you were coming from OS2, you could just pick OS2 as the personality that's a pretty big engineering challenge yeah um so i i like even in these early stages i don't know how ibm thought this would work i mean it's it's a good idea it's a good goal it's just technically maybe not the most feasible thing this is very much a solution searching for a problem it's a cool idea but how much did they need it in what use case, in what scenario does anyone turn around and say, no, nope, this is absolutely something everybody needs in their workplace. This is something everyone needs in their company. We need servers to do this and so on and so forth. Like what, at what stage does someone turn around and say, yep, that's what we got to have. IBM keeps running into this same roadblock multiple times where they're making something where it's not really clear there's someone who wants to use it. 
but they're like, yeah, you know, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out later on. We'll have fun with it. We'll get there. Yeah. This whole structure, it's not really the same as like what we might think of running operating systems on top of other systems today, where like maybe you've used like an emulator or a virtual machine app like Parallels or VirtualBox or something. This was much more tied together with the IBM microkernel than like modern equivalents of this. IBM added shared services to the kernel that would interact with all the personalities. So basically, instead of you necessarily having like five different network stacks running at once for each personality, they would all just plug into the one delivered by the microkernel. So IBM tried to reduce overhead with this approach. As we find out, it doesn't really work. But this isn't just like a system with five emulators on top. It's a lot more connected than that. So does that make sense? I'm trying to think of how I would try to summarize this. And I can imagine trying to say it as kind of like, imagine the human brain instead of having to learn multiple languages you just have a common internal design for understanding all languages and then each language just kind of gets added on top that's sort of what abi and api are yeah instead of one brain you have like a brain stem and then like a third of a brain for each (laughs) operating system (laughs) yeah Like, it's not the whole thing, but it's, like, most of it. And you got to figure out a way how to hook all those brains together. (laughs) So IBM showed off a very early build of Workplace OS at the fall Comdex in 1992. There wasn't a lot of reporting about this demo. I only found a couple people in, like, really old forum threads (laughs) talking about it. But basically, it was running OS 2. DOS, Windows 4 DOS, and Unix at the same time, but it, they weren't like super plugged in together yet. Each operating system was running full screen and you had to do like a keyboard shortcut to switch between them. So practically it's a lot like now if you're running like six virtual box things at once. <laughs> well, and the funny thing about that is it it's very reminiscent to, given its timing, that Like, everyone at that time was using KVM switches for moving, yeah, for having multiple keyboards, or sorry, not multiple keyboards, but having multiple computers with one keyboard and mouse and whatever. So it it was normal in people's mind to just want to have everything be switched. Plus, I'm sure they didn't have a UI that really made it make sense to, to do that. Maybe that's what it was. It was just a KVM behind the the tarp knowing ibm that's very possible yeah it was totally like wizard of oz like don't look behind the curtain there's just five computers (laughs) and a switch (laughs) a lot of the stuff that was presented back in those days was like that i mean even now even now that happens yeah it really does i remember one where i think it was when microsoft was showing off the xbox one i think And there was some picture that showed up online where some uh, Microsoft employee was like fixing one of the demos and it was very clearly just like a tower PC plugged into a monitor. (laughs) So Workplace OS development really started to kick into high gear around 1993. This is when IBM created multiple divisions inside their company and there were a total of five divisions and they were each working on one of the personalities for Workplace OS. Supposedly, around this time, there were around 400 programmers just working on the Workplace OS kernel. Just just that part. And over 1,000 OS2 developers were also helping the project in some way. So there was a lot of manpower and money going into this. And... By this point, IBM had still not proven that this was possible. (laughs) Like, I feel like, you know, obviously you have to get a few people working on something like this to start making proof of concepts to figure out if this is possible and you're going to have to spend money to pay those people. 
but I feel like there's a there's a step between that and getting like over a thousand people working on something <laughs> that they skipped, maybe. Well, to to be fair, half of the major technology that has been developed in the history of mankind really stems from like anywhere from one to maybe six people working on the really important stuff. And then once they get all of the hardest things built, then all of a sudden you drag in the like 100 other 200, 500 other people who come in and like polish it up and add all the uh, add all the other stuff. You know, look, look at the Swift programming language that was written by literally one guy for its first, I think, 18 months with with a couple small check ins from other people. And then after like after he kind of gave it the thumbs up, all of a sudden the project ballooned up like over the next two or three months. Yeah. And, you know, there there are a couple of projects where there was some absurd goal and no one really knew if it was possible and they just brought everyone on board and somehow it happened um, like the Apollo program. <laughs> <laughs> so also in 1993 in July is when the first power PC processors finally enter the manufacturing stage. So this is obviously really important for Workplace OS because it's supposed to harness the power of the power PC architecture. And the first batch of chips, like the power PC 601 and 604, they're pretty impressive on a price to performance scale. They're definitely very competitive with Intel. They're maybe a little bit late because this was all announced a couple years prior, but yeah, still still solid first attempt. The following year in early 1994 is when Apple starts selling its first Power Macintosh computers with those Power PC chips. Apple is really the only company that gets fully on board with Power PC at this point, and really ever, but especially at this point. So, work on Workplace OS is ongoing. But IBM really wants to have something for power PC computers now. So they ship the first beta version of OS2 for power PC in December 1994. So we're back to OS2 now. And this is a very weird product because the box looks like an OS2 box. You set it up, you install it. It looks like OS2. When you're using it, it looks and works pretty much exactly like the Intel version of OS2, but it's actually Workplace OS. It's Workplace OS, but the only personalities are OS2 and DOS. It's got the microkernel that IBM's working very hard on. It has the OS2 personality, which had been delayed multiple times because shocker, it's really hard to get all this working. So the first time anyone really gets a usable version of Workplace OS is the PowerPC edition of OS2. I, I would think that they also just have a general licensing issue for most of the operating systems. Yeah, 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 that was part of it. Especially with Apple. IBM and Apple kind of go back and forth on what they're doing. Because also at this point, you know, like we talked about in the Road to OS X series, Apple's trying to figure out what to do for their operating system on their Mac computers. Part of this also is that IBM's trying to convince Apple to use their kernel in what Apple's making, and Apple kind of thinks about it, but they, in the end, they decide not to use it. So there's a lot of dynamics going on here. But yeah, um, I'm sure that's part of the reason why it's just OS2 here. And... Because IBM doesn't have a lot of PowerPC hardware yet, there's only two computers that were supported for this beta, which were the IBM PC Power Series 830 and 850. You know, like I said earlier, it was very much like OS2. It looked pretty much the same, but it had no networking support, which was kind of weird because, as we've been talking about, a big focus for OS2 is the internet. And supposedly this was because the networking stack for OS2 was still 16-bit x86 code, and that was kind of difficult to port over. 
and they hadn't really finished it yet. So this couldn't do any internet stuff. But again, this was a beta, so like that wasn't super weird, but it was, it was kind of funny. So that beta release was in December of 1994. And 1995 is really when the whole Workplace OS project starts to fall apart rapidly. So one of the issues that IBM has early on is they're trying to develop a personality for AIX, which is their sort of like Unix derivative at the time that's on a lot of their workstations. And they just can't figure out how to adapt it to this microkernel. So they get, they basically set up like a dream team of like the smartest engineers at IBM. And they get them all in the room and they say, okay, we, we need you to figure out how to get AIX on Workplace OS. And the team goes and does their thing. They come back and they're like, I don't, I don't know how to do this, man. <laughs> <laughs> so... In like January of 1995 is when IBM comes to the conclusion that it can't develop a personality for AIX because of a few different technical issues. Basically just, it's really hard to get this running on the microkernel with the way the microkernel is designed. And this is kind of a big issue because one of IBM's goals for this whole thing was to migrate everyone on AIX to this new unified system. So... Instead of that, they try to make a more generic Unix-like personality for Workplace OS, but that wasn't really popular with anyone, so IBM just abandons that. Also, IBM is waiting for the PowerPC 620 processor before really pushing Workplace OS, because this is supposed to be like the big upgrade for PowerPC. I believe it was going to be the first 64-bit PowerPC chip. So this was the one they were waiting for that was just going to blow the socks off of Intel. And it was going to show how great all these power PC computers were and why everyone needed to go out and buy one. Uh, but that chip gets delayed because of bugs. And it doesn't end up coming out until a couple years later. So IBM's kind of left with, with nothing there. Also around this time, partially because of the delay, but also just PowerPC had been around for a little bit by this point, and there wasn't really a compelling reason for anyone except Apple to make PowerPC computers. PowerPC was, it was competitive with Intel chips at the time, but it wasn't like an upgrade. Trying to develop a new hardware platform means you have to have a really good reason for someone to switch everything they're running to the other platform. And PowerPC doesn't really have that. I think what you mean to say is that it's performance competitive, but not actually market competitive. Right. At this point, we have a huge collection of software built for the Intel architecture, not the PowerPC architecture. And even with some of that is being ported over, it's not enough. Early on with PowerPC, Microsoft had promised to make Windows NT for PowerPC, and they only develop a few versions of that before also giving up, because there's just no demand. So IBM is in this fun situation where Workplace OS isn't working out, uh, the PowerPC platform as a whole is not looking super promising, and Apple's the only real customer for those chips. So I'm going to read a section of a paper written by Freeman Rawson, who was working at IBM Austin on Workplace OS. And this is called Experience with the Development of a Microkernel-Based Multi-Server Operating System. And this paper does a really good job of showcasing how much of a mess this all is. So he says, One problem was with data formats. To be acceptable, the system had to permit the use of all its predecessor's key on-disk data formats, especially its physical file system formats. This created a number of problems, since despite the best efforts of file system architects, there are places where the physical format limits the logical processing allowed or forces semantic or implementation choices in the code. A good example is the FAT format used by OS2, which is also used by Windows and DOS and everyone else. 
FAT only supports eight character file names followed by a period followed by three character extensions. There was no good way to jam long file names into the OS2 FAT file format without generating an incompatibility, uh, which Microsoft later does with Windows 2, but it's it's kind of janky. So, Oh, it's super janky. <laughs> yeah. And also, like, they have to do that for all the other systems, too. Like, each system has its own file format that does weird things so you can imagine how much of a nightmare that must have been yeah um he also says there were also some semantic inconsistencies between the microkernel and the requirements of the operating systems mock 3.0 which was the kernel this was based on had been designed to make heavy use of copy on write lazy allocation and large sparse address spaces at some cost in both size and complexity its memory management was page-oriented and did not retain the allocation size. OS2 programs assumed a commitment-oriented memory management system with easier allocation and relatively minor use of copy on write. Worse, OS2's memory management was on a byte basis and assumed that the operating system retained allocation sizes. The result was essentially two memory management systems with OS2s built on the microkernels, which, while workable, greatly increased the memory footprint. So this needs essentially two ways to manage memory. And we're only talking about the kernel and the OS2 personality. They might have to do, assuming they would have kept working on this, they might have had to do that for other ones too. Mm -hmm. Which, <laughs> that's really not good. And it's especially not good because OS2 itself had the issue that it was it was too demanding of, of computer memory at the time. And now you're making that way worse. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I'm I'm trying to picture how I would how I would try to resolve a lot of this. And well, what I keep coming back to is this is why virtual machines kind of operate the way they do, where you're just running a whole freaking OS inside of basically a simulated box because you you just want to allocate basically a big pool of memory to an OS and let the OS do its job. You don't want to have to try to figure things out on behalf of an OS that's going to work a certain way. Applications are built under the presumption that the OS is going to work a certain way. And you're you're never really going to know or be able to anticipate things. Plus, obviously, competition between each personality is going to cause issues. Yeah, the solution the computer industry has created for this issue is just virtual machines. It's give each system the block of computer. You get one CPU core, you get four eight gigs of ram whatever and you just that's your space but ibm is trying not to do that because computers at the time cannot have five virtual machines running at once the the computer industry didn't just solve it with that they solved it by throwing money at it in the literal sense of just jam in as much hardware as you can that was the solution to most of these problems just stick in more hardware as much ram as you can and, like, that solves your problems, which also more computers. Yeah, like, IBM's just, they're trying to, they're biting off more than they can chew, given the limitations of computers at the time. My favorite part of this whole paper is he gets to a point where he does benchmarks between a PowerPC computer with Workplace OS and a Intel computer with OS2. A lot of the tests are kind of close like there's some where workplace os exceeds slightly like he did like some graphics stuff that workplace os was better at or there was some stuff that just native os2 on intel did faster but there was one that really stood out and it showed that heavy file operations on workplace os were three times as slow as os2 on the intel pc oof <laughs> yeah like do you do you know how hard it is for the bottleneck of file operations to be the software and not the hardware it, no I, okay that's not necessarily fair believe me there were some bad situations where software was a huge slowdown in early days of android 
I wouldn't be able to tell you which post, but I wrote several of them that were kind of like, hey, the Android team's saying that they're going to fix this. Good, we finally have a fix coming for this thing. Or, hey, there's this thing. Let me explain why it was a problem. It does happen. Yeah. But three times as slow. That's... That is bad. That's not good for something that's supposed to be really modern and good performance. Also, just the, the premise that... We're talking about a microkernel with, okay, yes, some layers on top of it, but a big point of microkernels is that they're supposed to be lightweight, fast, and efficient. Obviously, that's not happening here. Yeah. Because it's offloading so much to the personality. They have to have so many layers interacting with files because each operating system expects like a completely different file format. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, ugh. Yeah, so this was a mess. That That's what I'm trying to get at. It's like nothing was working well. Shocker, it was very difficult to get multiple operating systems that were built completely different to all work together on the same computer, sharing resources, basically. Yep. You know, all this has been happening in 1995. In December of 1995, we get the final release of OS2 for PowerPC. Even though it's labeled as a final edition, it's it's not really finished. IBM never really finished this. This is still kind of a beta product. So I have a InfoWorld article by Jason Ponton from January of 1996 that you can read for us. All right. After a delay of nearly two years, IBM last week finally released OS2 for the PowerPC. By special order only leaving many observers to believe that IBM's much-hyped PowerPC effort is in trouble. Interested customers can request the developer's edition of OS2 Warp Connect, PowerPC edition, from their sales representatives, who in turn must request it from the company's development lab in Austin, Texas. But IBM officials say that they have no plans at the moment for a general release of the PowerPC version of OS2. Quick, quick aside, uh -huh. yeah, the moment that you have to order a thing basically like special order it seems like it has to be like custom to your hardware or specially designed for you as yeah. a customer if... it's not it's just a printed cd <laughs> exactly that that yeah. is that is inherently such a like it's it's something you might expect in a server market it's something you might expect in specialty situations not something that's supposed to be kind of for everyone right or this even is... like a limited subset of people but still like general use that doesn't right. work it's not like a lovingly handcrafted piece of art on etsy it's everyone got the same mass manufactured cd print <laughs> yeah um, artisanal but... operating yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah. Linux found its way to that. Why can't, why couldn't IBM get there? Every Linux CD is personally signed by Linus, and he gives the <laughs> jewel case a big old kiss on the lips before mailing it to you. All right. Anyway, continuing on. PowerPC OEMs will not be getting OS2 for PowerPC code, and retail outlets will not be receiving shrink-wrapped copies. Analysts say IBM's move may be further evidence that the time for the PowerPC to challenge Intel has come and gone. Rob Enderlay, and apologies if I butchered that name, an analyst for the Giga Information Group in San Jose said, the customer base would not accept OS2 and PowerPC at the same time. By the time they finally shipped it out, the power to price ratio of the PowerPC processor just wasn't good enough to make customers accept all of the other drawbacks. Sources close to IBM say development of OS2 for the PowerPC, beyond the additions shipping this week, is on hold, and the prospect of any new iterations of OS2 for the PowerPC is undecided. I will say this article does a very good job of trying to be objective and not <laughs> inserting <laughs> any opinions whatsoever, because anyone, any person reading that with any awareness of what is going on would be like, yeah, IBM's done. 
<laughs> they don't want anyone to use this. If you're making a software product that has to be special ordered, they do that to limit the distribution. I, I agree, but my take on this is a little bit different. I don't know. Maybe you never did this, but I certainly did. Writing, f writing for a news outlet, one of the absolute things that I started doing at a certain point was writing in a very neutral tone. If you have the awareness, if you read it and know what's going on, all you have to do is apply the sarcastic voice to it, and all of a sudden you totally get it. Everything totally makes sense. It, it All of a sudden it becomes... Sources close to IBM say development of OS 2 for the Power PC beyond the edition shipping this week is on hold. And the prospect of new iterations of OS 2 for the Power PC is undecided. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden, you know what they're saying. Yeah, it is very much like if you have basic reading comprehension, you can read between the lines here. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I've got a scan of like a booklet that came with this final edition, as IBM called it. And I just like the introduction. So I'm going to read that. It says, Welcome to OS2 War Power PC Edition. We hope you were pleased with the software that was designed to run on the IBM Power Series 830 or 850 computers with IDE. So again, just like the beta, this runs on two computers from IBM and nothing else. This doesn't run on Macs. This doesn't run on PowerPC computers from other companies. Package description. OS2 Warp PowerPC Edition consists of the following products. OS2 Warp version 3 for the PowerPC. So this was based on OS2 Warp. It has the IBM microkernel the IBM file server, the IBM registry, the bonus pack, and an application sampler. OS2 Warp PowerPC Edition combines many familiar features of the OS2 Warp Intel-based system with the power to handle a new range of applications made possible by the RISC architecture of IBM Power Series computers. However, the architecture of OS2 Warp PowerPC Edition is different than the Intel-based version. Specifically, OS2 Warp Power PC Edition is based on the IBM microkernel that provides operating system functions, operating system services, and system policies. There are also shared services outside the kernel that provide functions such as driver support, file systems, and so forth. In addition to the new architecture, other features and capabilities inherent in this product differ from the 32-bit OS2 Warp Intel-based product. So that's a very nice way of saying this is very different than what you're used to, even though it looks the same and it has the same name. Loosely put, if it doesn't work the way you want it to, that's on you. <laughs> yeah, don't come crying to us. You special ordered this, buddy. <laughs> yep. Again, this this wasn't changed that much from the beta, which is really funny because this has the same OS2 Warp Connect branding as the Intel product, and it's called Warp Connect because the internet was a huge feature of this, and this still does not have internet support. That's definitely one of those situations where your marketing guys are going to have a real problem with you. Yeah, so there are screenshots and other information about this from people who actually have these rare IBM computers and have tried this out. It has the same APIs as OS2 for Intel, so it can technically run OS2 software, but it can't run existing OS2 software. There's no emulation layer for running Intel OS2 apps on PowerPC OS2, which is actually Workplace OS. <laughs> so, well, okay. So I think more specifically what you are saying is the applications could be recompiled to run on this one and possibly without even changes, but you wouldn't be able to take the existing compiled examples and just carry them straight over. It's not binary friendly. Right. So uh, so the end result of that is that there's no software for this PowerPC version. Because again, like basically no one used this because IBM never really released it. So no one had a reason to recompile their apps for this. The most interesting part of this release 
is again it it looks like OS2, it works like OS2, and that includes the DOS compatibility layer that OS2 has had. IBM re-implemented that DOS virtual machine in OS2 on top of the microkernel. And that DOS layer did have a Intel translation component. So you could run DOS software that was written for existing PCs, you know, five, 10 years prior on this power PC version of OS2. And that included Windows. So you could run Windows 3.1 on top of Workplace OS, on top of PowerPC, and it all translated on the fly. And it worked exactly like OS2, where you could have like the Windows software running side by side with OS2. That's kind of the coolest part of this is like we're doing behind the scenes emulation and it's basically invisible to the person using it. It's a wonderful proof of concept that runs three times slower. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Don't do benchmarks on it. (laughs) So again, the project was really falling apart in 1995 and in December was when we got that power pc release that still wasn't really done and you had to jump through a lot of hoops just to get your hands on it and in march of 1996 is when ibm fully canceled the workplace os project and closed its power personal division so that's the end we never see other personalities running on it really it just never happens you know the real clincher of that or the part that sucks just imagine all the developers out there who worked on this and this is objectively hard stuff to do and get right and just imagine how many of them are like well there's a huge chunk of my resume that just looks like it never happened so when ibm canceled the workplace os project they still kind of wanted to sell power pc computers i don't know how badly they wanted to because again they only had two at this point (laughs) so (laughs) you know when they canceled it they announced that they would start selling macintosh clones with apple's mac os and that those mac clones would come out in the second half of 1996 yeah this was during the the era in apple's history where they were licensing the Mac operating system to other companies making power PC hardware. And some of those third party Macs were better than the Macs Apple was making. <laughs> However, those never actually shipped as far as I could figure out. And that was probably due to the fact that Apple had sort of put a hold on Mac OS licensing around that time. And then when Steve Jobs became intern CEO in 1997, he ended the Mac clone market entirely. So uh, IBM reportedly spent around $2 billion on Workplace OS. So that is $2 billion that could have been spent on anything else, like OS2. <laughs> Because during this whole time, OS2 is really struggling. And instead, IBM just dumped a crazy amount of resources into this other thing. And all they had to show for it in the end was a microkernel that no one really wanted and a beta operating system for two computers that could not connect to the internet. Well... On the plus side, they had a really good tax write-off. Yeah, maybe. I wouldn't rule that out. I'm thinking somebody got fired. And not even necessarily for their own fault. I, I mean, maybe. It's hard to... It's it, it's impossible to know. Like, who really was at fault, or was there really fault to be assigned here? But, yeah. It just, it just does not seem like this was going to end well for anybody involved. Again, like one of the reasons OS2 wasn't working was because Microsoft had been signing agreements with almost every company that was shipping computers to bundle Windows. Do you know how many of those agreements IBM probably could have made with $2 billion? Oh, yeah. Like they could have gone to every single other company and said, how much is Microsoft giving you? We'll double it. We'll triple it. Yep. But instead they spent it on this. 
they tried to compete honestly good for them <laughs> yeah so so anyway that's that's workplace os and in the next episode we're going to go back to os2 around the launch of windows 95 when ibm said i don't think this is working <laughs> <laughs> which was about six months before the implosion of of workplace os <laughs>